What is going on guys? My name is Johnny Retro with the Facebook group Bolorama Pickers Lounge and I'm here today to talk with you guys about a ton of stuff. Uh, you may have seen the title, you may have some questions, concerns, some queries about what exactly I am talking about and exactly where I've been for the last few months. Uh, it's probably been about a little over two months since the last time I did an upload and I felt it was more than overdue <clears throat> to come back here and put some new content out for you guys. And uh, we're going to continue to put the content out until the end of the year. And then I'm going to start dialing things back just a little bit. But I can promise you, I'm never going to be gone for good. Uh, thrifting always runs deep in these bloods and I'm not going to be going anywhere anytime soon. So uh, recently over the last week, I put out a open question on the Pickers Lounge group asking if anyone had some questions regarding eBay or myself while I was recording this video. And we're going to go over a few of those here today. Uh, first question up came from Miguel Godinez. I apologize if I pronounced that wrong. Can you go over how to best use the whole promoted listing thing on eBay? Um, that never uh, has been uh, has never been too clear to me. So when it comes to doing promoted listings, it's something that uh, eBay, I think they kind of stole the idea from Etsy because I know Etsy has been doing it for a little while now. But if you've ever been scrolling through the search results and you've seen something where it said promoted listing across the top, somebody is essentially paying on the back end for that listing to be there. So the way a promoted listing works is you start a campaign the same way that you would start a sale, but you're restricted to 500 items with that campaign campaign, you can take items that you have listed as good till canceled listings, not anything else, and you can have up to 500 of them, and they have to be items that you have in quantity. If you have a single of an item, it cannot be used for a promoted listing. Very early on in the beta days, when it first came out, you were able to, but no longer is that the case. There's also certain restrictions when it comes to which categories you can do promoted listings in, for the, but for the most part, your mass market categories are going to be acceptable. Uh, toys, hobbies, arts and crafts clothing, uh, car parts and accessories, your big major top tier brands are going to be eligible for that. You start seeing some restrictions when it comes down to categories like collectibles and stuff like that. You'll start seeing a little bit of a hindrance there. Uh, and the way it works is you choose a percentage between 1 and 20% that eBay is going to charge you on top of your final value fees to help get this item sold. And uh, the reason you'd want to do that is let's say you got, like I did, a ton of ink cartridges. Uh, let's say they're worth a little bit more, so it's kind of worth putting on eBay. And you might have a price point that's slightly more aggressive. Let's say the competition's around $13. You have yours at $15. You say, okay, I can afford to give an extra 10% away because uh, you know I'm charging an extra 15% more. I'm going to give eBay 10% of that money. And then in turn, they're going to show my listing more often in search results. So not only is it going to show up higher in the best match, uh, you're also going to get placement on the main page. If you've ever been on eBay and you've been scrolling through stuff and you've seen, uh, uh, you know, like the, the, the tiles on the side that show items on the side that are relevant searches, what they like to do is they like to show items that other people have been, that like within the category or realm of items that you have been searching. So if you've been searching for, let's say, puzzle boxes, for instance, and I have a bunch of puzzle boxes for sale, mine are going to show up on the side as a promoted listing. Now, when that item sells, regardless of it was uh, eBay's fault, or not for getting that item listed, you are still due for those fees on the back end. But you can choose anywhere from 1% to 20%. And if you have an item that's really slow moving and you say, you know, I don't want to run another sale on it because it's really not getting the job done. I've tried 10, 15, 20% off. It's not working. Maybe take that 20% apply it towards the promoted listing feature and see if you can get that item shifted. I mean, it's pretty much a, what do they call it? Robin Peter to pay Paul. You know, you're taking from one hand and giving to the other. Works out the same in the end, but it gets you a lot of traction on items that might be slow movers. So it's certainly something to look into, to dabble into, but just make very sure you're careful of your margins and that you're protecting those closely. Uh, next question up comes from Ryan... Kinison, Kinison, um, what's the average time you spend in a thrift store? I go on my work lunches and I only have about 30 minutes to shop. And he also had a follow up question. He's like, what's your method when you only have short amount of time to pick? So for me, my average time in a thrift store, it really varies. But I can tell you year over year over year, the amount of time I spend there seems to get shorter and shorter and shorter. And part of that has to do with the fact that I see the same thrift stores over and over and over again. And what happens is I start seeing similar items on the shelf, so I'm able to process quicker. And a lot of items I've looked up at some point in time, whether it's at that store or a different store, 
And then after a while, you start to get, you know, what we call the eye. And the eye can sometimes be wrong, but most times it's right. And you can tell, okay, this is a chintzy product that was made, uh, you know, made in China for a dime. And there's no way that's going to be worth anything. And you start speeding up your filtering process. Now, if you're running on very limited time, I would say target the categories that you know the best. Some people are really good at video games. Some people are really good at clothing. Whatever you have the most success with and you generally have the biggest margins, try and target your time there. But don't by any means not make a quick pass of the entire store. If you only have 10 minutes at a thrift store, walk through every aisle as quick as you can and you know maybe even grab up some of the maybe stuff, throw it in a cart and spend those last two minutes there looking things up before you hit the cash register. Register. Not walking by a shelf can be exceptionally costly. Uh, you know, I was uh, near a thrift store the other day. I popped in, uh, maybe spent five, 10 minutes there, and I found a pair of bookends worth $600. Okay, and th these things can happen. Uh, but, you know, as I'm going to get to a little bit later in this video, it's starting to get a little bit harder and harder. So the next question, Ryan Miller asked, uh, what do you do that you feel contributes to the most to your success and where do you want to end up in life? Is reselling just a means to the end or is it something that you will always do? So earlier I said, you know, reselling, it's, you know, it's, it's in my blood. It's something that I love. It's something I've been doing since I was 12, believe it or not. I used to buy video games from kids at school and I'd clean them up and I'd flip them out and I'd get them on the cheap because they wanted some extra lunch money. They wanted to go get a Frito boat or something. And I'd take advantage of that opportunity when I had a few bucks and I, didn't want those extra luxuries to be able to turn that into more money. So for me, reselling is something that I know it, it's always going to be a part of my life, but as far as how active I am, how productive and how hard I work at it, and then as well, the big, big final one, the amount of money I actually make from it, that is going to taper off in time. But there's never going to be a day where something cool can't be put in front of me and then I wouldn't be interested in buying it for the right price. So... <sighs> You know, this is where the, the hard part of the video comes in because I've made a big transition over the last four months. I launched the new company February 1st. It's been almost four months to the day since I launched that business. And I'm at the point with the coupon book company where I've sent everything out to the publisher and my product should be here in five weeks time to be able to start moving the product. And the reason for this transition, it, it's... It's a lot of things. Uh, when we talk about being successful in life, it means a lot of things to a lot of different people. Some people say, if I'm making you know, $100,000 a year, I'm gonna be a success. For some people, they say, if I can go on four vacations a year, I'm gonna be successful. Some people, it's uh, completely different than that. They say, if I have a happy wife and happy kids, or a happy husband and happy kids, I'm a success. Each person's definition is a little bit different. For me, it's always been a nonstop, constant battle of time freedom versus financial freedom. And I really do look at them as two pendulums in a sense, or two, uh, eh, whatever pendulums. I, I look at it in that sense in, in the way that having a whole bunch of money is really, really great, but not having any time to spend it makes it worth a lot less. And then the other is true in the sense that if you have a whole bunch of free time, but you don't have any money, the time loses a lot of its value as well. And a lot of people, we, we play this battle where we're trying to compromise between the two. And I'm not going to lie, I've been a victim of that myself, where I've been doing that year in and year out for the last five or six, seven years of my life. And that's kind of the thrifting life for you, where you're always dumping more time in than you really want to, but you do have a good amount of money. But the real end goal for any of us doing this is where we can sit back and we can say, I have all the time I could ever ask for, and I have all the money I could ever ask for. And this vision was very much so realistic 20 years ago, 15 years ago, 10 years ago, when reselling was kind of an underground thing. And we've seen a lot of changes since then that make being a professional reseller much harder than it truly needs to be. Because 10 years ago, I mean, pe people who have been picking for that long can testify to how the things have changed over time. I even made a little bit of a list here. Um, 
you know, that I titled the death of reselling as we know it. And it's, it's scary in a sense. You know, one of the first big things that I started noticing is that the prices of items at thrift stores has gone up dramatically. And I'm, we're just talking in the last two or three years even, but I've seen items that were a dollar normally go up to the two ninety nine tag. And now it's at $4 and you can say, Oh, you know, it's not like that in my area. You know, it's not happening. Well, Goodwill is a nationwide chain and they use the California area as a test market. When they start started doing categorization, when they started using new tags. I start seeing these new tags at stores out of town. It's starting to spread, you know, and if the prices are going up here, they're going to go up everywhere. I've been to other towns where the prices are insane. $6.99 and $7.99 is the average for what I look at and consider trash. So we're seeing the prices going up a lot. I've even seen $80, $120, $200 tags being cranked out at Goodwills. I'm seeing the same thing happening with Salvation Army. I'm seeing other little mom and pop stores. I'm seeing Heinz Hospice. I'm seeing everyone getting on this trend of raising their prices. Now, why is this? Okay, we there's a lot of elements that play into it. One, we have the devaluing of the American dollar. We're not going to lie. Our money's going down in value a bit. Okay. You know, the buying power it has is, is dropping dramatically. And then we're also seeing an increase in minimum wages right now. And when minimum wage goes up, everything else starts getting more expensive. That's a big problem with being a reseller is that when things like minimum wage here in California going up to $11 an hour within the next few months, and then I think they're still talking about doing this 13, 14, $15 bullshit by, you know, next year, that destroys the livelihood of resellers because the the buying power we have goes down and our income stays exactly the same. You know, the idea is that, oh yeah, these people are going to have more money, but the reality is the people who were making two or $300 a week before who never shopped on eBay and Amazon aren't going to start jumping on there and clamoring to go buy items now that they have an extra, you know, hundred bucks a week or 200 bucks a week. They're going to spend it on the same shit they spent it on before. And it's not really going to benefit us the way it's going to benefit other sectors. You know, the food industry, the entertainment industry, the service industry, they all benefit. The reselling industry, not so much. You know, will you see a bump in sales? Maybe. Okay. But here's the thing. We have to talk about where that additional value in sales is actually going to go. Um, the next thing that's really become a new trend for me that I've started seeing is I call it the availability of product. And it's, you know, Yes, I'm going to have that one-off day where I'm going to find $1,000 worth of cosmetics, $500 worth of bookends, $200 worth of video games. It's going to happen, yes. But I'm talking on the overarching grand scheme of things. When I first started this years ago, I could go into thrift stores and I could fill a damn shopping cart. And not because I was inexperienced, but because the product was there and the quality was there. But the the I, I guess you could call it the scene, you know, Everyone wants to get their hands in this right now. And there's nothing wrong with that. I used to sit around. I'd say there's plenty to go around. There's enough for everyone. And you see shows like American Pickers, Storage Wars, Pawn Stars. You see shows like this that uh, glorify and sensationalize exactly what we're doing. And they don't really capture how difficult it is. And what you end up getting is you get a large percentage of people who are going out there and they're not buying for reselling. They're not even buying for gifts. They're buying for themselves. And what ends up happening is we start seeing a depletion of goods on the shelves. And we, we've also seen less quality of goods getting donated in. Now, a lot of people haven't really paid attention to the fact that the quality of products has gone down. And the reason the quality of the products has gone down, it's twofold. One, the baby boomers are dying right now. And the baby boomers were, were some of the biggest donators of high quality goods, and they're simply dying off. Number two is that the viability of being able to sell products by yourself is at an all time high. How many resellers out there right now have two, three, four, five different buying applications on their phones that they can also sell on. We're talking offer up, let go, Facebook marketplace. Uh, you know, the, the access for the general consumer to be able to reach out to potential buying customers all time high. And what that does is it destroys the placement for resellers, the secondary market and consignment style workers to be able to capitalize on that, you know, to be able to be really, really successful within this industry right now, you have to be able to scale up to a large, large level. You know, I'm fortunate that I got in at the time I did because it, it afforded me the opportunity to build up an inventory catalog that was large enough to coast me through what I'm going through right now. You know, I haven't mentioned it before, but the last four months that I work, I made zero 
dollars. I don't get paid for any of that work that I've done and I don't make profit until the book comes out. But I was lucky enough that I had, you know, the foresight and the inventory to carry me through this period. It's just, it's tricky. Okay. Just the, the way that the, the direction that the market is going right now and the things that are going up to make our job harder. Okay. Not, all, not just all the things but I, that I mentioned, but the little things that keep adding up year over year over year. Look at shipping cost. I remember when I first started, I was able to send a first class package, three ounces, maybe all the way up to eight ounces. It was two dollars and sixteen cents, two fifteen. I know some of you remember that, and some of you who started before me remember sub two dollar rates. eBay could go to USPS and negotiate for a better rate. They really, really could, and they're not doing it. I know for a fact that if it wasn't for eBay, the U.S. postal system would have died long ago. But I know for a fact there's millions of packages moving every single week that our eBay items just change in hands, just back and forth. And that's what's keeping it afloat. So unless we can get better shipping rates, every time we sell an item, it's not just the fact that we had to pay $4 for it now. It's the fact that it's going to cost us anywhere from $260 or $280 all the way up to almost $4 four and a quarter to be able to ship that item first class. But now we have to factor in the other effects too. We have eBay fees, we have PayPal fees, and both of those have gone up as well. Give me a moment, guys. I need some coffee. So we're seeing, we're seeing increases in eBay fees, PayPal fees, the base cost of the item, even some shipping supplies have started going up. I mean, don't get me wrong. It's nice that eBay gives us a credit and gives us some free shipping supplies. It's not enough. It really is not enough. Everything's getting more expensive. And I'm going to touch on this very briefly because I hate talking about it. Taxes, okay? Certain people are being affected more than others by these tax increases, especially people who, um, you know, didn't sign up for Obamacare and they have to pay their penalties. And we're, we're just seeing rises in costs the whole way through. The whole way through. And... Any individual one on its own, we'd be like, it's completely fine. It's not a big deal. Just leave it be. But the fact that they're all going up all the time. I mean, shipping's gone up four times in the last two years. It's constantly getting more expensive. And what that does is it cuts into our margins further and further and further. Items that we used to be able to buy and we'd be content making five bucks on, if we buy them now, we might make a dollar. Okay, that's a really big problem because for someone like me who enjoys purchasing smalls, let's say I would get 100 of those a month and I was making $5 a piece on them, that was an extra $500 or six grand a year. Now, those same items aren't worth touching. It's literally like me losing $6,000 because items that I used to buy are now ineligible for purchase. They cost too much and I won't make enough. I just can't buy them. So this, this is another one of the problems that I see. It. On, on top of everything else that I was talking about, is category restriction and branding restriction. More and more and more am I starting to see restrictions happening. Amazon sent me a letter the other day saying, I can't send CDs in or music or vinyls or cassettes. I'm pretty sure it's the whole umbrella. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I can't send this stuff in anymore. I've probably done over $5,000 in the last 12 months in CDs on Amazon. I'm required to send in a purchase order, three of them. Okay, from major manufacturers, which means I have to buy a crap ton of product to be eligible to sell on Amazon. What was wrong with everything I was doing before? Nothing. But you know what it is? It's the counterfeiters who are destroying these markets. So we, we have people making counterfeit CDs, counterfeit DVDs, counterfeit VHSs even. I mean, the anything you can think of that can be counterfeited, it's being done, and that's what's destroying the viability for genuine and serious workers like myself. People who have actually put the hard work in, authenticated their items, and then shipped them incorrectly to Amazon. So we're seeing more and more doors being closed. We're seeing brand restrictions. Uh, Rosetta Stone, Beachbody, um, on Amazon, I know there's like issues with Nikes and Levi's and all kinds of different brands. And we're just seeing the systematic closure of what we're allowed to sell. It's happening. They're, they're bringing the walls in slowly, day by day by day, and just knocking off little things here and there. Remember when there was a, a, a it was blacklisted to sell Microsoft and blacklisted to sell Sony? And I think there's even some restrictions on Nintendo right now, but the walls are coming in closer and closer. And this isn't like a little bit, 
little tiny things here and there. These are major brands. These are major categories. I can't sell CDs on Amazon anymore. I'm literally going to lose thousands of dollars. Thousands and thousands of dollars. I used to be able to walk into a thrift store, scan a shelf of 200 CDs, and easily find 500 plus dollars worth of value that I could send directly into Amazon, and they sell. They're not like sitting there for years and years. They are selling. I probably moved a good 90% of my CD stock over the last six months. They're fast movers. But knowing that I can't even do that anymore, it just makes me wonder. It's like, how am I going to put together a box of 60 items for Amazon now? Okay, certain things are restricted like, oh, you can sell this used, but you can't sell it new, or you can sell it new, but you can't sell it used. The walls are coming in. It's just getting tighter and tighter. We have issues too with supply and demand. Okay, this is a big one. This is one that's really, uh, really troublesome to me. Okay, is the video game market. Okay, video games aren't restricted, not by any means. But we have a big, big problem going on right now, and it's not apparent to most of you. The counterfeits, or as they like to call them, reproductions, are out of hand. What used to happen on video games, let's say I had a copy of Mario Brothers, I listed up for 30 bucks. maybe somebody else has one for 25 27 28 and as those ones sold, new ones would take their place, and we would see a gradual increase in market value as more people were buying them than people were selling them. It would be a very slow process. You'd see a game like Mario Kart for the Super Nintendo maybe creep up about $5 over the course of a year. We'd see high-end games, really expensive stuff. You know, Earthbounds, for instance, they would creep up maybe $50 over the course of the year, and every now and then you get that crazy anomaly where a game can jump up $200, up to $1,000, because the demand, the amount of people who actually wanted this item was substantially greater than the amount of people who are willing to put it online. Certain other games you would see, okay, maybe there's like a thousand copies of it and they only sell 10 a year, we'd see the opposite. We'd see the prices starting to trickle down a little bit. What's happened over the last six months with counterfeits and reproductions on eBay is batshit, okay? I've seen games that were typically 50 or $60 games down to $35 because the counterfeit copies are $25. And to be competitive in this market, when the counterfeits are out there, people feel like they have to price more aggressively, okay? And it's true because the average person going on there to buy a product doesn't care if it's real or fake. They care if it works. And it's undermining the entire category. And you say, well, not all games are susceptible to that. I had customers coming in, we, we see fake Game Boy games, Nintendo games, somebody told me about a fake GameCube game, which is actually a disc-based game, that means they're stamping out fake copies of it. No category or no part of the video game sector is truly immune from this. And it's not just those common games that are making a problem, it's the high-end games, the games that cost $500, $1,000, or $2,000, and you can buy a reproduction for $100, okay? Now this $100 reproduction costs just as much as the $20 game or the $15 game or the $5 game to produce. They can make as many as they want. And that's the other problem. So now we have a, an active captive audience, a large number of people who are interested in buying a specific item, but we have an infinite amount of supply. Okay. It'd be one thing if it was limited, we could say, okay, there's one to one or 10 to one or one to 10, but we have a, a good size audience here and an infinite amount of supply here. This supply will never end, but this will. The number of people interested in this item will dwindle over time. And what happens when this party starts getting smaller and smaller, these prices start coming down lower and lower. And it's not that the individual game is a big problem. What's a big problem is when you start seeing prices shifting across the entire market. When you have, let's say we take the total value of all Nintendo games for the original Nintendo and we say it's it costs maybe about $30,000 to buy the entire collection. Okay, now we have reproductions coming in and starting to soften the market. I've seen over the last six months, maybe the whole collection can be bought for $25,000 right now. Next year, we're going to sit down, we have this same talk again, we're going to say $20,000. It's because the supply will never run out, ever. It, it costs almost nothing to make these fakes, and people are okay buying them. So we're seeing the death of a very, very big category on eBay and Amazon. We're seeing it happen. And what do you think is going to be eBay's response to this? Okay. As of right now, 
It's been nothing. They don't care. They're not pulling listings. They haven't made a public statement about it. <clears throat> they did when it came to coins. I don't know if you remember that. You used to be able to have the reproduction coins that have the little R on them. And they said, hey, we don't want you selling those anymore because people are filing the damn R off of them. And then they're flipping them out and trying to get the full value on them. eBay will not step into this category because video games is one of their highest grossing categories. They could give a rat's ass if three fake copies get sold for the value of one real copy because those three copies would not have sold in the same day. So they make the same exact amount of money. What's going to happen though, <clears throat> over time, as the supply gets satisfied, you know, the need for those items gets satisfied and the total sales start going down and then the total gross value of the sales starts coming down, eBay will raise their fees. Okay, this is the counterfeiters winning again. They will raise their fees direct to the consumer and they'll start affecting categories that have nothing to do with video games. They'll say video games are one of our biggest cash crops. You know, uh, we need to keep making money, though, to keep everything alive. Raise the price on clothing, antiques, collectibles, firearms, whatever it might be. Jack up the prices on those ones. That's what we need to do just to even things out. And it's going to get worse and worse and worse. I talked about this months ago during the last episode of the podcast. I said, what did I tell you guys? Think about it for a second. I told you guys, eBay is going to continue to try and gain market share over Amazon, but they're going to lose it. Amazon is going to make a more intuitive and easy to use user interface for their buyers. We have a completely revamped Amazon shopping app that is much easier to navigate, much easier to find the items, much easier to read relevant reviews, and one touch buying makes it so much easier to buy items on eBay. eBay is going to die to Amazon. It's going to happen. You're going to see over the next four or five years, and I know what you're thinking, well, eBay is a place for a very specific type of item. Well, it is if eBay can afford to stay afloat. They're not in the big, you know, strong profit margins quarter over quarter. They're, they're doing, let's find out. I'm not even sure how well they're doing, but I don't think they're going to be doing that great. eBay stock prices over the year. Okay, eBay over the last, oh God, well, they got a little bit of growth here. Um, over the last three month period, but they're on a steady decline from here. Let's go one year. Let's take a look at that. Okay. Well, I, I, I retract that statement just a touch. They're up, but they're not up much. Okay. Uh, hmm. Well, that's impressive. Okay. Well, I take that back, but I do believe as a whole, eBay is going to struggle to continue to retain dominance within the marketplace. I just don't think that their <clears throat> level of relevance or level of importance or necessity is going to stay there for much longer. I just, I just see things continuing to change. So here comes the next problem. The next big problem <clears throat> for people to be successful within this industry, it's scaling. It's saying, how do I go from me, myself, and I going out and picking, sourcing, listing, packing, shipping, and doing 100% of the work how do I get from that point to where Jay was saying we can have all the time we want and all the money we want? What is required to go from there to doing it all yourself to be able to have more money and have more time? You have to hire people. Herein comes a whole other problem. Hiring people, paying taxes on people, um, the, the requirements to hire people, either having part-timers, full-timers, paying their wages, paying their benefits, workman's comp, business licenses, tax liability, it is absolutely batty to consider scaling up a business like this. Now, have I seen people do it? Yeah. Yeah, people who have massive connections, who have pallets delivered to their, their warehouse or even their house. And they, they just have these connections to where they're able to get a ton of products. They're working directly with businesses. They're looking to liquidate dead stock to them. We're talking people who have holdings of over a million dollars worth of inventory. I don't have a million dollars worth of inventory. I'd be lucky if I had a hundred thousand dollars worth of inventory left at this point. And I worked my ass off last year, but I never got to a point even over the last two years where I could have somebody on board for more than a week. Okay. And it's not like I had them in for a week and then I couldn't afford to keep them. No, I brought them in for very specific projects. When I had 
you know, 20 or 30 boxes come from New York of inventory that I needed to be sorted, processed. I need people on the phones to call buyers. We we're making a lot of shit happen, you know, a couple of weeks here and there. Or when I needed somebody to help me sort through all my inventory so I could do inventory checks and everything. But the biggest problem is trying to scale this business up. It, it can be done. It's just exceptionally difficult when you want to do it the right way. Now, if you want to do it the illegal way and you want to pay people cash and you want to, you know, keep everything off the books and you're not really reporting how much you're making or how much you're actually spending or you say you drove 30,000 miles last year instead of driving 10,000 miles, that's on you. I'm not here to judge. Trust me, I am the last person that's going to judge you for being dodgy. I know exactly how that goes. But I will say it's difficult as all hell to scale this company if anyone was going to pull it off. You know, from the ground up, I really thought I had a chance at it, but I just never saw the light at the end of the tunnel. I was always the one doing all the work, and it wasn't a little bit of work either. I was putting in a very solid work week. eBay alone, I'd probably give it 30 hours a week. Amazon, probably another 10 to 15 hours a week. And then we have Patreon, and then I have the video game store, and then I have, you know, side projects and stuff. I just never found my footing, and I tried desperately. So this goes into my next part. Ryan had asked, you know, what do you feel contributes the most to your success? And I really feel that a strong work ethic and a lot of determination and believing in yourself will take you to where you need to go. The number of people I had come to me, and I'm sure you had people come to you and say, are you really sure this eBay thing is going to work out? Are you really sure that you're going to be able to make money doing eBay? Are you really sure that you're not a failure is what they're asking you. They're, they're challenging you as a person and saying, are you sure you're not so much of a failure that you can actually make this work? And if you've looked in the eyes of people who have asked you those types of questions and you've been able to tell them, I'm going to do this. I got this. I'm going to make this work then you're the right type of breed for this job. Now, I've met people who aren't, and I've seen the people who have failed. We've seen it in the group. We've seen people put posts up that have said, you know what, guys, I tried, it didn't work for me. No, you didn't try, okay? Because anyone who tries their hardest will succeed. You will. So yes, determination and hard work. I work harder than anyone I know. The only person that can even give me a run for my money is probably Juan Galvin. That boy is a beast. And mad props to him for his work ethic and his determination. He should be an inspiration to everyone in the group with how hard that guy works. He, he top-notch, grade-A type guy. So if you have those characteristics, that's what's going to take you far. That's what's going to contribute to your success, as Ryan asked. He said, where do you want to end up in life? I want to make a million dollars a year. Okay, And I've said that to some people, and I've heard a plethora of responses. I've heard people like Seth Duncan look me in the eyes. He's like, you'll do it, bro. You got this. I believe in you. And he really means it. I've instilled enough faith in him through my actions where he believes it. And I've told other people I've gotten laughed at hysterically. They thought I was a madman because society teaches us that we need to go to high school college, take our degree and go make our 60 to $80,000 a year and just suck it up. That's how life is going to be. The life of being an entrepreneur, the life of being self-employed, the life of doing it on your own and making something for yourself is frowned upon by everyone. Are you sure you're going to be able to do it? What happens? What happens if the items don't sell? Then what? What happens if people don't want them? What happens if they break? What happens if the post office loses all these what ifs? I like to judge my ability to succeed not based on others' failures. And a lot of people do that. When I, I was on a, 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 a Patreon call the other day and I, had, I was asked, have your sales been down? Have you not been doing well on eBay? And I told that person, you should never judge your ability to succeed on other people's failures. When you find comfort and solace in the failures of others, it's a larger reflection on your willingness to accept failure within your work. If other people are failing, doesn't mean I should fail. And if other people are succeeding, 
that doesn't mean that I should succeed. Now, the smartest thing you can do is rather than mimic those who are failing, is you mimic those who are succeeding. Those who have taken that next step, they've pushed hard and they've accomplished something and you see what they're doing. You say, wow, I can't believe that's working. It's because you, you don't have it in here yet. Now, if you look at it and you say, wow, I'm gonna do exactly what that person's doing. Yeah, it's a great fucking idea. You know, when, when I first saw Storage Wars, you know, the TV show, people buying storage lockers. You know what I did? I looked at that and said, that is a great idea. And I went out, I bought a whole bunch of padlocks, loaded them onto a backpack, and I went out to my first storage auction. It was the worst mistake I ever made in my life. I was surrounded by people buying items for themselves. I really liked the idea of it, though. So I went back out again. This time I went to a different type of auction where they open the units and they pull everything out. This was more my cup of tea. I could see what I was getting. I could make educated buys and I could sort out the people who were competitive for resell and people who were competitive to buy for themselves. And I could make more educated buys on what I was getting. And that's what got me into reselling. I had seen what other successful people have done and I went, I'm gonna take some of that, thank you. And went out there and started doing it myself. So where do I go from here? Um, the last part of the question is reselling just a means to an end, or will you always do it? You know what? Both. I will always want to be a reseller, but it truly is a means to an end. I will never be a millionaire doing eBay. I'll never be a millionaire doing Amazon. I'll never be a millionaire doing YouTube. I'm not able to get there. I've accepted that. I've accepted I've gone as far as I can possibly go. I will not be a millionaire selling video games out of my shop. It's not gonna happen. I took it as far as each one will go. And I tried my damnedest on each and every one. So that begs the question, how are you gonna be a millionaire? How is it going to happen? And the bigger question, how are you going to be a millionaire? Because my late friend, Chuck, he was uh, 67 years old, one of the finest men I've ever had the pleasure of meeting and knowing, spending time with, and sitting down and talking. My favorite phrase he would always tell me, he would tell me, you're never too old to be a millionaire. Some of the people watching this video right now, you don't realize I'm 31, okay? I might look younger, but you could be 50, 60, 70, 80, I don't care. You are never too old to be a millionaire. If you really believe and you really have the know-how and fortitude and you circle yourself around other people who believe that way too, not the naysayers, screw all the naysayers, the ones who don't believe you, the ones who are doubting you when you have that really great idea and you go to them and you say, hey, what do you think of this? And they're like, no, that'll never work. Why? You say, oh, I wanna make widgets for a living. That's what I wanna do, I wanna make widgets, okay? And you go to that person and you say, you know, what do you think? I think this is a really great idea to make some widgets. And they look at you and they they have no experience with widgets. They don't know what they are. They've never made them, never been in the manufacturing process, never been in retail, never done sales, never done marketing, never done advertising. They barely even know you. And they'll sit there and they'll <laughs> crap on your dreams. Don't take the advice, help and guidance from those who don't have to suffer the consequences. I know I'm going on a tangent here, but it's important. It's very important because I had a really good idea to make a coupon book. And it was such a simple concept. Produce a coupon book to benefit small and medium-sized local companies. That's all I wanted to do. Just you know, be able to take my skills in advertising and marketing, uh, graphic design, um, you know, street teams, uh, sales companies, uh, networking and really be able to capitalize on that basic idea. How's it work? I went to over 500 businesses in the last four months by myself, hard canvassing, knocking on doors, making phone calls, making connections and networking and talking with companies and seeing who I could get to participate in a coupon book. Of the 500 I went to, we were able to sign on 101 businesses. And I will tell you right now, that is a screaming success. We're gonna be producing the book. This is what a blank copy looks like. This is a white one, nice, high gloss, 112 pages in total. We have 110 offers. It's, it's gonna happen. All the information sent out to the publisher, they have all the files, the logos, the offers, 
my introduction, my choice for the five best businesses in Fresno that I had the pleasure of working. We're calling them the editor's picks. I took this very basic idea in nature and I said, okay, if I do this, will I become a millionaire? And the moment I realized it was possible and viable, I put the brakes on everything else. I love, love thrifting, but my financial security and my well-being will always take precedence over the type of work that I enjoy. And I know people around me all the time who say, yeah, you know, just, I do this because it's fun. I do this because it's easy. I know I don't make much money doing it, but it's something that I enjoy. You know, you go enjoy a steak dinner. Go enjoy a night out on the town. Don't make your job, you know, don't make it mandatory that it's enjoyable. If it's enjoyable, great. If you get benefit out of it, great. But just separate the two. Ask yourself, what is it going to take to get to a million dollars? With this, I have to stress the importance of planning for your future. Am I saying eBay and Amazon are dead today? No, not by any means. But I'm going to say it's going to get a lot worse over the next three, four, and five years. Really, come back and watch this video in five years. It would really make my day if you came back and watched it and, and see what impact has happened to the market over that time. Okay? Be prepared. I can't emphasize this enough. Be prepared. When you start moving your inventory and you start making more money, start putting it away. Put up enough money. That way you can make a decisive decision when the time comes. How much money is enough? On average, thirty to forty thousand dollars. If you can save thirty or forty thousand hard cash, hard cash, not you know, in inventory, not in you know, uh, you know, tied up in bonds or anything. We're talking hard cash. You can easily start your own business. Okay, you can even buy an existing business. There's a, there's a shop down the way. It's called Full of Bull Sandwich Shop. I can buy it today for $35,000. Non-negotiated. That's his asking price. It's a sandwich and pizza shop with all the equipment in it, all the marketing, branding, logos, everything is done, and boom, it's turnkey. I could walk into that business that's struggling to make $40,000 a year and turn it into a business that makes $100,000 a year, and it won't even be that hard. Or you can go another direction. Okay? This whole video wasn't about this pitch. If you enjoyed all the content in this pitch or in this video and, and that's all you came here for, I want to thank you for watching. This business that I've started up, I'm going to be franchising it. it it's going to spread out. I would like to come to everyone's town. If you want to have a coupon book business in your town, I can make it happen. Okay. It's not exactly cheap to get into this industry. How much is it going to cost me to print my first run of books? 10,000 books is going to cost me $23,000. That includes shipping costs. It is expensive. But we're all about the margins, right? Okay. Well, what I'm offering my sales reps is a very high commission. So $23,000 worth of books equals $173,000 worth of profit for me after I pay them. $173,000 for one order of 10,000 books. I plan to sell three orders worth of books over the next year, maybe year and a half. We're talking close to a half a million dollars, okay? And it's, it's a very easily and replicable process. And then franchise dues and me coming down there. What's it take to start a new town? Probably about $30,000, okay? Why did it take me four months to do it? I had nothing. This is what I had, okay? I had a white book with blank pages to show businesses. I had no analytics. I have no clue how good my book would do. I could only sell the promise that it would be everything that it's going to be. And now I have to follow through on that promise. And I need to market and advertise and develop a street team. And you're going to ask yourself, well, Jay, <clears throat> you talked about having more time freedom and more financial freedom. How does that happen? You have to forgive me, guys. I've been talking for 45 minutes straight. So... How does that happen? How do you get the two of those things? We call it leverage, okay? The basic premise is simple. Would you rather earn 100% of what you earn in one day or what you work for in one day, or would you rather earn 10% of what 10 people earn for you in one day? Leverage is how you get to time freedom and financial freedom. It's how you balance the two out, okay? 
I'm gonna check really quick for more questions, guys. Okay, no more. So when you have the two, when you have the leverage, what it allows you to do, it allows you to focus on big picture things. Big picture things would be like setting up events, uh, setting up meetings, doing some hiring, things here and there. But it is not indicative on you actually going out and performing a traditional work day. What it's indicative on is you being able to train and motivate, inspire other people to go out there and make a great wage. I expect my sales reps to earn over $1,000 a week. It's, it's, it's two and a half times the average in this town. And if I'm able to offer that to sales reps, there's going to be a line of people eager and ready to go out there and start selling and start working. If I believe in the product, okay, which I greatly do, and I produced an amazing product, it's not a matter of just getting the businesses on board. My book is going to retail at $40 and it has 16 pages. The first 16 pages are absolutely free offers. The customers have to pay nothing. They walk in, they redeem their offer. $300 worth of product right off the bat for a $40 book, which means it's going to be one of the easiest books that anyone has had the pleasure of going out there and selling. And then the last thing you do, what are we doing here? Let's see if I got it over here. Yeah, the last thing you do is you take on a cause marketing partner. We're partnered up with Valley Children's Hospital, the local hospital, literally saving lives. I'm gonna get rich, I'm gonna save lives, and I'm gonna teach 40 or 50 people how to go out there and be rich themselves. It's the best of every single world. So if I've scared the shit out of you just a little bit, and you're worried about the state of reselling, it is still early enough you can do something about it. Whether you take me up on my offer or you take on some other offers, Subway's a great franchise. Uh, what's that one coffee shop? Real big coffee joint. Some coffee options as well. There's tons of franchises that you can buy into. The cost of franchise ownership varies dramatically. Anywhere from 30000 some franchises cost a quarter of a million. It all depends on what you're looking for. But be prepared to take that next step. Money sitting in the bank is worthless. Money that you apply to something that can generate you more money is worth 10 times more than the money in the bank. Okay? So I want to thank everyone for sitting through this entire thing and watching. And do me a favor in the comments below, tell me what you want to do next. Don't tell me what you're doing right now. Now is mildly irrelevant. Tell me what you want to do next. Tell me what your ends to a means, or means to an ends, means to an ends are, where you want to go in the future. Do you want to be a millionaire? Do you want to own your own business? Do you want to take on the daunting task of scaling eBay? Or do you just want to retire? Are you just tired? You just want to call it a day. Tell me what you want to do in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, I'd really appreciate it if you'd slap that like button down below. And I'll see you guys soon.